Deep within the freshly annexed Canadian Northwest Territories, a trail of shadows creeps across the land, the trees trembling beneath the oppressive weight of their darkness. Lurking just above the majestic peaks of the forest canopy is a convoy of United States Navy airships. The USS Liberty, USS Justice, and USS Freedom, en route to the front lines of Alaska, clinging to the contours of the landscape below to avoid detection. Their complement of VB-01s forming a protective screen in precaution. On board are the fighting men and women of the Union, along with the logistical might required to sustain them. Although lightly armed and armored, the airship fleet can venture where others cannot. Whilst a ship needs a dock and a plane needs a runway, an airship has need of neither, making an airship fleet uniquely equipped to serve as the logistics backbone of the United States Armed Forces in the remote northern regions of the Union before the Great War, and as the flagship of the Brotherhood following the aftermath of atomic annihilation. The Brotherhood of Steel understood the value of an airship quite well, having operated a fleet of pre-war airships at one time in their history, although one by one, each ship was lost to the shackles of time. Thus, following the route of the Enclave at Adams Air Force Base, the Brotherhood embraced the opportunity presented to them by the carcass of their enemy that remained to resurrect their fleet. Realizing there was not enough materiel to create more than one vessel, the scribes set to work enhancing the pre-war designs, providing genesis to the most advanced airship ever fielded, the Pridwin. Named after King Arthur's legendary ship of old, she took two years alone to design and at least twice that to build. Upon her completion, she became the flagship of the mighty Brotherhood and the symbol of their power. Within her holds, an entire chapter could be deployed at a moment's notice to whatever wastes required the Brotherhood's attention. Circa 2287, following an engine retrofit from within the bowels of Rivet City, she would do just that leaving the capital wasteland behind for the Commonwealth on a nightly crusade of historic consequence. Ad Victorium. The desire for an airborne aircraft carrier is a tale almost as old as flight itself, originating as far back as 1917 during World War I, when experiments were made launching Sopwith Camel fighters from Her Majesty's Airship Number 23, and is a tale that continues to this day, with the Lockheed C-130's Hercules Dynetics X-61 Gremlin concept aircraft carrier. Over the last century, there have been many other attempts to envision such a system, such as the B-29 Peacemaker X-85 Goblin aircraft carrier that in theory would allow four fighters to be deployed and recovered from the bomb bay, or the 747 aircraft carrier concept that would sport a squadron of Boeing Model 985-121 microfighters internally. In fact, there has even been a concept for an atomically powered transport plane known as the Lockheed CL-1201 to be equipped with 22 externally mounted parasite fighters in addition to two internal shuttles for air-to-ground relations. Without a doubt, though, the Pritowin is inspired mostly by the Zeppelins, with the Fallout 4 art book describing the design philosophy of the Pritowin as full-on diesel punk, combining elements of Zeppelins and naval vessels using mysterious technologies beyond simple hydrogen to keep it afloat. Given that the term Zeppelin is often used as a colloquialism for rigid body airships as a whole, I believe the art book should more accurately state that the Pridowin was inspired by the Akron class of airships of the United States Navy. The Akron, the first ship of the Akron class, was the fourth U.S. Navy airship, designated ZRS-4. She was a helium-filled, fabric-clad, rigid airship, meaning she had an outer structural framework that maintained the structural integrity of the craft, rather than relying on the internal pressure of the lifting gas to maintain her shape. The Akron, along with her sister ship, the USS Macon, were the first of her kind, a purpose-built flying aircraft carrier, boasting individual hangars for the airframes on board. The Akron class was designed to house a complement of five Curtis F-9C Sparrow Hawk fighters to be launched and recovered using a trapeze mechanism dubbed Skyhook. 
although the Akron was actually only able to field three fighters due to a design flaw that had structural components blocking access to the two rearmost hangars. That was corrected when the Macon was built, fortunately. Sadly, neither the Akron or Macon had successful careers, both serving for less than three years before being lost in accidents. The Prudewin, unlike the Akron class airships, has been in service for at least five years, but like the Akron, is a rigid body airship, although her material is decidedly metallic in nature, in stark contrast to the canvas design from the 30s. Although rare, exceedingly rare, such a metallic design has actually been successfully fielded. The ZMC-2, or Zeppelin Metal Clad II, was, as the name suggests, a metal-skinned, rigid-body airship that was operated successfully by the U.S. Navy from 1929 till 1941, when she was subsequently scrapped just months prior to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The Prudewin features a length of 540 feet, or 165 meters, balloon span of 135 feet, or 41 meters, and an alleged weight of 40,000 tons, or 40% of what the USS Gerald R. Ford weighs. That mysterious technology the designer mentioned must be magical. Maybe they thought they were still working on an Elder Scrolls title. The Prudewin is confirmed to be nuclear powered, following the installation of Rivet City's power plant as previously mentioned, and is heavily reliant on coolant, reactor coolant to be specific. An item, I'm not gonna lie to you, I had no freaking idea even existed. Apparently, it is three parts antifreeze, five parts dirty water, and two parts nuclear material contained in a solitary gas canister. Am I the only one that doesn't understand why nuclear material is part of the recipe? Why would you want nuclear material in your coolant? Wild. Anyways, back on track. She is capable of docking four VB-01s upon the gantries located on the lower mezzanine via a skyhook system that attaches to the tail of the vertebrae. Interestingly though, in the concept images for the Prudewin, she features docking space for six vertebrates. And in her cinematic entrance to the Commonwealth, she has more than four vertebrates escorting her. As far as the concept art goes, this inconsistency doesn't really bother me. Concept art often doesn't escape the touch of implementation fully intact. That being said though, it is a shame. More vertebrates is undeniably better. Also, the concept art features a mooring harpoon, as well as an upper deck that is implied to be capable of launching fixed-wing aircraft. And that would have been hella neat. In regards to the intro scene, personally, this doesn't actually bother me that much either. Although in-game, the Prittowin is only capable of docking four vertebrates, as previously discussed at a time, that doesn't mean more couldn't be traveling with her. The others, depending on how many we are talking about here, could easily be rotated in and out of the docks to maintain, for lack of a better word, fighter screen, or to perform scouting duties. Additionally, the distance between DC and Boston really isn't that great, considering we're talking about nuclear-powered aircraft here. So more vertebrates could travel with the Prudewin than could actually be berthed by her at any given time. Although, the lack of gunships parked on the Boston airport tarmac doesn't exactly support this theory. Either way though, I think it's okay. Certainly not great, but okay. Interestingly though, her air wing is her only offensive armament. Heck, her only armament at all. Although, for some reason, when trying to destroy the Prittowin with the Minutemen, good old Preston Garvey suggests five artillery systems are necessary to overwhelm her defenses. Truly odd considering the loading screens outright tell us she has no armaments, a fact that is easily confirmed using the ocular test. This segues us quite well into the pros and cons section. At least, I think it does. As always, starting off with the good. I wish the Prittowin was actually viable in the real world. It undeniably looks cool, from the sexy tail section with her well-defined control surfaces to the unicorn horn at her bow. It's all aesthetically solid, at least in my opinion, and I'd love to travel to Denver in a civilian variant of such a craft. I also like the fact that she uses some magical fallout gas to stay afloat rather than just simple hydrogen. Believe you me, if she was using straight up hydrogen to get high, I'd have a bone to pick. 
You know, since I don't like my airships going up in smoke like the Hindenburg, I also like that there are storage tanks for the magical gas found all around their ship, both for the aesthetic funfetti they provide and for the practicality. Speaking of funfetti, with the exception of the copious amount of unnecessary support cables, I like all of the extra details. There are two smokestacks towards the front top side of her hull, preventing the exhaust from the fusion reactor, along with multiple top side coils that I assume to be radiators for heat exchange for the coolant. Likewise, I appreciate the tires sprinkled about her underside, even though they aren't exactly super aesthetically appealing, making your one-of-a-kind airship look kind of like a tugboat. They do make a lot of sense, however. I mean, you don't want your new helmsman to accidentally hit an iceberg midair on her maiden voyage and sink when a simple tire could absorb the impact. In all seriousness, though, the tires are a reasonable protective measure for landing and whatnot. I'm cool with it. Speaking of midair icebergs, though, it's a good thing she has all those spotlights to light up the night. I'll admit, though, the spotlights are a bit of a mixed bag, since, you know, it also lights her up like the Topps Casino, presenting herself as a nice, juicy target as well. Oh well. On a more functional level, the four vertical lift jets are well defined and look like they would get the job done, although I'm going to suggest some enhancements in a bit. Similarly, the rear engines also look neat, though I'm a little surprised to see the mixing of propulsion methods. I'd have expected to see a single large thruster to the rear rather than an array of propellers. But I get it, when you are trying to hit that Zeppelin aesthetic, props are certainly more classically appealing. Then we get to the meat of her design, her trapeze system. I think the Pritowin sky hooks look really neat. I like the fact they appear to be able to extend pretty far out to allow the docking procedure to occur as far away from the hull as possible. They also look to be well articulated and are of a nice stocky build. That being said though, I'd have liked to have seen an operator control station with good visibility incorporated into the design, or at the very least some optics, so it could be believed that the process was automated. I will concede though, in the rear spire there is a control room that would be pretty ideal for this purpose. Unfortunately, it only contains a single console and is otherwise filled with trash. Finally, before I move on to the cons I have with the Pritowin's design, I have to call out the fact she has a good, not great, interior with pretty decent scaling, at least in comparison to the Anxa. We will take a brief walkthrough of her compartments in a bit, but it's certainly warranted mentioning here. My first con with the Pritowin is admittedly also a little bit of a pro. Did y'all notice that the Pritowin had an assault ramp at her bow? I certainly did not. Not until I saw the concept art, specifically, that called the feature out. Listen, I like assault ramps as much as anybody, and I like its inclusion here, but sadly it doesn't look practical at all. It's too narrow, being about 4 feet wide, and doesn't really swing down to a portion of the ship that would be accessible so that you could actually, you know, take advantage of it. Compounding this issue is the fact the mezzanine that accesses the assault ramp when it's rotated down is blocked with safety railing that does not appear to be easily removable, rendering it about as useful as the Akron's rear hangers. Then, in a bit of a nitpick admittedly, I don't really understand why the canvas section of the hull roofing exists. Just make it all plating. I mean, I suppose it does allow for reduced weight, but when you already have a 40,000 ton vehicle here, is that really a concern? I don't think so. Next up, we have the Pritowin's mooring system, which tragically does not feature a harpoon. Instead, she is moored from four inaccessible hardpoints on her bow to the similarly inaccessible top of the flight control tower of the Boston airport. Seems to me there are only two sketchy ways she could have been moored in this fashion. Either she pulled up close enough to the control tower that she could slow dance with it, and an initiate walked the plank onto the roof of the tower and then fastened the lines, or the feat was accomplished using a vertebrate or a knight equipped with a suit of T-60 power armor with the jetpack modification. Either way, not exactly convenient and a pretty obvious design flaw. Now we need to talk about those dang support cables. I understand why some of them need to exist, namely those that are providing structural support to the catwalk suspended far below the Pritowin's superstructure. 
For example, the cables supporting the end of the docking gantries. Check out! All those cables around the unicorn horn and the catwalk between the two spires, though, seem absolutely unnecessary. Perhaps more damningly, a significant number of these unneeded support cables are in close proximity to the docking gantries and seem like a disaster just waiting to happen. I know I wouldn't want to be the scribe that has to tell Elder Maxon another vertebrate got tangled up in those superfluous support cables. Then again, I also wouldn't want to be the scribe that has to explain exactly how freight and the like ends up on the Pritowin. There are no freight cranes or anything like. So how exactly did Liberty Prime get loaded and unloaded onto the Pritowin? Are we really expected to believe his parts could be broken down into small enough components that they could all be transported in the belly of vertebrates? Even if we were to believe that, which I don't, how exactly did those storage containers in the main deck of the ship get there? There are only man-sized bulkheads leading in and out of each compartment, so moving freight like that into the hold would be impossible. It's a crying shame, really, as there's a lot of wasted space on the main deck that could have been used as storage holds and interior hangers, mitigating this issue. Finally, I don't love that the Pritowin is little more than a floating target. I'd have loved to have seen at minimum, defensive turrets and anti-air guns. Although perhaps this omission is not particularly surprising given Rivet City, a standard aircraft carrier was also missing such armaments. Still though, there are plenty of places on the lower mezzanine that could have had manned anti-air batteries and pretty much her entire hull could have had auto laser turrets to function much like the Phalanx SeaWiz systems, making Preston Gravy not sound crazy. Similarly, we know she was built using the remains of the Enclave. We know the Enclave had energy shields, albeit energy shields that require pylons everywhere, but still, wouldn't it have made a lot of sense to integrate this sort of countermeasure into the Pritowin's design, given how much of an exposed target she is guaranteed to be? Oh well, I'll make sure to include these enhancements when I touch on the changes I'd personally make to the Pritowin's design in a bit. First though, let's briefly take a deeper look at her interior. Her interior is broken up into two sections, the command deck and the main deck. The command deck contains the bridge at its lowest level and the scenic meeting room at its peak. There are also external access points to the flight deck and fore deck. If I was to give this section a grade, I think I'd go with a B-. The bridge looks neat, although the visibility is lacking and I'm not sure why there would need to be two ship engine control throttles four feet apart from each other. Meanwhile, the meeting room is spacious and offers breathtaking cinematic views, but really probably should have been used as the main bridge, with the current bridge serving as an auxiliary bridge for landing and such. For the most part though, the reason I'm giving the command deck such a low grade is because of the sheer amount of wasted space and potential here. The rear portions of the deck are essentially wasted space, with a couple of lockers thrown here and there for an aesthetic pop. I mean, I'm not asking for the space to be World War II submarine levels of cramped here, but I would have liked to have seen a clear purpose for each space besides getting from point A to point B. Then we get to the main deck, where much as the name suggests, the meat of the ship is. The main deck is essentially one giant space within the Pritowin superstructure that is split up into four levels. The lowest level is primarily just a service catwalk, with a few areas for storage along with a recreation space that is essentially a couple of chairs and a terminal. Apparently, they couldn't even swing for swiping a couch from the airport terminal from below. What fun! On the second lowest level of the main deck is where most of her mission critical functions are located, as well as the private quarters for the highest ranking members of the Brotherhood. Working from the bow to the stern, there is the spacious Admiral's Quarters for Elder Maxon, Captain Kell's Quarters, and the Player's Quarters, none of which have bathrooms. Much like the whole ship, actually. I think we can all see how that might be a bit problematic, no? Although I must admit, I hadn't actually noticed that particular detail until just now. Proceeding aft, there is the adequately sized sick bay, followed by the galley, and then the four bay power armor maintenance and engineering section of the ship. Then capping this level off at the stern is the armory. Now we arrive at the second highest level of the main deck. This level consists mainly of open space crew quarters and storage spanning from the bow most section almost all of the way to the stern where the research lab is located. The lab is complete with the corpse of a super mutant, two broken synths, 
live mole rats for testing, and a botany lab. Finally, there is the top level of the main deck that consists of a central catwalk cutting through the gas containers that are keeping the Pritowin afloat, leading to the forecastle on the bow. I'd give the main deck a C, mainly for what's missing here. There are no bathrooms, no hangar bays, no reactor, no engine bays, and no possible way for the storage spaces to actually take on material. A real pity considering this deck has copious amounts of space that could have been better utilized for such purposes. But hey, at least the scale checks out. All right, now for all you fine folk that are still with me, I'd like to discuss how I'd hazard to improve the Pritowin. First, I'd make the four vertical lift thrusters more useful by moving them up from the flight deck towards the middle of the superstructure while keeping them extended from the hull. I'd also have put them on swivel mounts, allowing them to provide the Pritowin with enhanced maneuverability through the ability to direct the thrust. This change would additionally free up a lot of real estate on the flight deck, allowing for more docking gantries. This would in turn increase her air complement capacity from 4 to 12 I reckon. I also think it would make a lot of sense to replace the rear propeller cluster with a large main thruster while adjusting the rudder structure to accommodate this, but I'm going to go ahead and keep the propellers for aesthetic purposes much like the designers. Next, I think I'd honor the concept art's vision and install the upper deck, although I wouldn't try to launch any fixed wing aircraft from up there, since there realistically would be no way to recover them. What I would do though is install a few sets of anti-air turrets up there along with a set on the stern and bow of the flight deck. That way, her gunships are not her only form of protection. Speaking of protection, like I touched on earlier, I'd install automatic laser turrets on her hull to function as SeaWiz defense guns, in addition to installing some rudimentary enclave shielding. Concluding my sensible changes, I would add exterior maintenance catwalks to make it more believable that she could be worked on while in flight or hovering. And I'd also go ahead and replace the canvas sections of the ship with metal in addition to removing the unnecessary support cables and adding a freight crane along with cargo bay doors. The final, and albeit kind of dumb enhancement I'd make, would be to undersling battleship style Gauss cannons underneath each of the Pritowin spires. I know it's not the most sensible, but I can't resist the appeal of the Pritowin having some offensive weapons she could bring to bear against the horrors of the Commonwealth. And hey, while we're already here in the realm of absurdity, I'd go ahead and add some gauze cannons to the stern and bow of her top deck that would make the Yamato blush. I mean, if we can have magical lifting gas, we might as well have absurd guns, right? What do you think? Did I hit the mark with these enhancements? Be sure to let me know.